So we are going to copy a drawing by an artist named Paul Cadmus today. Um, this is a seated male figure. It's very compact pose. And we are going to, this is a typical pose that you might see in a figure drawing group where the model doesn't want to pose standing up. So we are going to think about the big forms first and stay very loose. We're going to think about the head to the rib cage connection like that. And notice that the whole, the gesture here is really like a letter C. So I'm starting to think about the movement of the spine into the pelvis. And here's the direction of the thigh. It's angling up just a little. Notice that the knee comes out about as just a little farther than the forehead. And we can think about some really simple angles here. This, this angle is obviously really important. Notice that the leg And this angle sloping down just a little. And this angle, which is the bottom of the upper arm. And notice that the front of the foot is pretty much parallel to this arm direction. It's just a, it's a little bit stepped up. And we can look for this line too, which is moving the same direction. And here's another pair of parallel lines. And here's a third that's, notice that this line is parallel to these two. That's something we've been working on, is looking for these kind of sets of parallel lines that are distal from each other. The sternum is the same angle. You see that? And th these series of lines really help give the drawing its rhythm. So the sternum, the top of the thigh, and we have every reason to believe this is probably not accidental, the artist may have emphasized some of those similarities. So this is kind of the basic geometry of the figure. And as you've come to expect, the next thing we're going to do is the, the head, try to get something understood about the portrait. And this is really going to 
give you a lot of challenges because of the fact that the head is partially covered by the arm. So we have to sort of picture, you know, that the chin would be under the deltoid and the fir my first step, this is kind of a big challenge, but the first step is to look for the shadow break because that's going to help us think of it in terms of three dimensions. So I'm seeing the shadow break kind of like this. So let's try that. Let's put that. Notice that the eye is way down closer to the arm and the shadow breaks along the forehead. Something like that. This is not anything that you would do without any training. This is not a natural th way of, to approach this. But you can see that by dropping that shadow in, we are starting to, our brains are going to start to register this as a three-dimensional form. Um, then the neck is going to be a little higher than I was suggesting before. Uh, what I'm looking at is this ratio between the lit side and the shadow side. And now I'm going to place the ear in relation to the eye socket. You see how the ear is just a little bit to the left of the eye socket. And the hair is pretty full, so it's a little bigger than the skull form that we started with. Kind of like that. Rest, here's the rest of the hairline. And this is the jawline. Um, it's important, significant that the, the hand here is sort of overlapping a little bit of the forehead, so we We'd better suggest that before we get into any detail with the, with the face because we're not seeing the, we're seeing almost the whole forehead, but not entirely. And now when we draw these features, we have the advantage of we're kind of popping them into a volume that we can read with our eyes. So let's try that. We're going to put this eye here inside this eye socket, this eyebrow, um, the other eyebrow over here. the bridge of the nose and the other eye which is very small and foreshortened and just a little bit of the ala right about here. going to erase my shadow map because this is a very soft curve. It helped to draw it definitely in the beginning, but now we want it to be more of a subtle turn. So we're going to shade across that turn, and we're going to look inside these shadow areas for the darker darks, which ha happen sort of at the bottom of the cheek here and a little bit of the nostril showing. And along the shadow break of the forehead here.
so it's really hard to get the scale of this head right when, as I said, you can't see the whole thing. I think I need to make my ala just a little bit longer. And I'm going to leave it here. So I apologize. I, I probably should have zoomed, zoomed in more when we did that head. Um, we are now going to... Move on to the hand. Um, you see how he's conceptualizing the hand with like, here's, here's the line of the knuckles, which comes right near the top of the hair. And here's the body of the hand, which is very foreshortened. And it's shaded along this, this side to show that it, the boxy kind of form of the hand. And we're going to start with this finger. Look at how beautifully these fingers are drawn. They're really. Like every knuckle is legible, but it's there's not but they're drawn very simply. So there's the pinky. Above that division we have two more divisions, so I'm gonna divide this up roughly into thirds. This finger kind of folds behind the pinky. Believe it or not, with practice, you sort of start to draw fingers the same way you draw letters of the alphabet, like very instinctively, but nobody starts out that way. And at first, it's, they're pretty awkward, but they get easier. So now I'm going to be looking at a negative space, which we do talk about sometimes as a way to sort of dig ourselves out of trouble. So I'm in a little trouble here. I seem to have way too much space from my original block in. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw this shape. I'm going to be very definite about it. And that's going to help me find the contours of the arm. So here's that little negative space that shows me that the bicep is bulging a little more. You can see the bicep bottoms out right under the nose. And then the deltoid curves above the cheek. And this side of the arm is a little higher than I initially estimated it. If you follow this line of the knuckles, you can see that this, this back of the forearm is sort of just past that curve. So it's actually a little closer than I thought to where I had it before. This 
this interesting thing that's happening here is that this um, forearm is, is flattened out against the shin, and so it's really very wide. You see how, see how wide it is? And that's unusual. It's, be, it's actually wider than the upper arm. But that's from the compression of the arm against the shin. Um, I kind of simplified this line of the knuckles. If we drill down a little, you can see he's doing a little symbolic ellipse for this knuckle. He's doing a little shading under this knuckle and another little shading under that knuckle. A little more like that. And we have a little suggestion here of a little compression fold because of that sharp angle that the hand is turn, turning at. So the top, top of the deltoid is curving. It sort of ends about level with the bottom of the earlobe. And then we're moving into some of the shoulder blade muscles. Here's another bulge here and then here. Remember the shoulder blade is a floating form, so its position against the rib cage is not fixed. So you have to learn to look for it. And I'm going to drop a little horizontal in to show that if we go from the tip of the nose straight over, that's sort of where this little overlap of the armpit happens. That's making me feel like this distance is a little short, so I'm just going to raise that a bit to compensate. So here's our tricep. This is that division between the pectoralis muscles that roughly coincident with the sternum. And 
up here we have the latissimus dorsi muscle along here. So we're going to sort of just lightly indicate it. Probably the best way to learn anatomy is to do master copies like this with a little anatomical reference to one side so you can um, learn to associate the things you're drawing with muscles that you can name. Cadmus understood a lot more about anatomy than I do, so. I'm going to be able to provide limited sort of annotation of this, but it's a start. So here is our rib cage form. Got another bulge right here, which looked to me like the tail end of the shoulder blade. And look how tightly this skin feels like it's stretched on this side of the body. And on this side, relatively compressed. He's got these little compression folds. So you really feel that the sort of, the skin's really like pushed together and compressed on this side and really taut on this side. Okay, we're going to lean into another negative shape here. You see that little thing? It's going to help us find the other leg. And notice that the elbow comes down just a little bit past that shape. Like about to here. Here's another little negative shape to the left of the elbow. And that's going to cause me to, see, I, I had indicated the top of the thigh here. It's actually going to be down here. And that's why I started my drawing so faintly. You can see that very loose and very faint because I always end up having to move stuff around. Now we've got room for this other compression fold under the abdominals. This form here is called the external oblique. And 
And here coming out from underneath the latissimus is the serratus muscles. A lot of beginners, when they draw these serrations, think they're drawing ribs, but these are actually muscle, muscular forms that um, insert into ribs. So the spacing is the same as ribs, but they are not ribs. So here's slight compression of the muscles above the knee, sort of pushing those up. And then this knee has to stay behind this line that we drew earlier. Since I'm doing some revisions down here, I might want to take a measurement just to see. So this is what I'm trying to establish, is this height from here to here. And I want to find something to compare it to. So see how it's about the same as this height, which I've already drawn. So that's from here to here is about the same as from here to here. So it's going to cause me to lower my ground plane predictably because I had to lower the thigh. So This form is a little confusing. It feels like it should be a little more shadow right here, but I don't really know what I'm looking at. It's the back of the calf, but I don't quite understand where the why there's so much light right here in the drawing. Here's the heel. Here, what I'm thinking of is sort of a series of um, egg-like forms. You see there's like one here, 
one here, and one here. And that one was a mistake. Whoops. OK, let me try again. Yep. You feel that rhythm of the top of the knee, the bottom of the knee, and then the heel. And we could even think of this body of the foot and the base of the big toe as a sort of continuation of this little series. So it may feel like the foot's a little big, but I think I think I'm drawing it okay. I think it's like that intuition is because the this this pose is so compressed. It's like folded tightly into itself. So um, that's causing the foot to look bigger than it is, if you ask me. I'm going to give you guys a hand in a second, but let me just throw in some of the cast shadow. So notice the shading direction on the cast shadow on the ground is mostly going to be horizontal. That's what we have learned to expect. And darkest right where the skin touches the ground.
Paul Camus did a lot of printmaking, and it's... really a good idea to tr try to copy some of his hatching direction because just get to get a feel for it he's making some v really good decisions about um, hatching direction that really helps us to understand the his un his, his conception of the form so even if you're not that happy with the structure of your drawing, it's a good idea just to do what I'm doing now and just go back over, add the shading, but um, try to imitate some of his decisions he's making about line direction. Um, Cadmus is drawings do not have a strong flow corresponding to his handedness. He has a little more of an engraver's touch, so it's like all different directions. Um, but they're all, every, every shading line is descriptive of form. in a very elegant and economical way. It's really kind of hard to shadow map this pose. Like there's mostly not a lot of areas of clear shadow, mostly half tones. Here under the thigh is one of the clearest areas of true shadow. You'll notice he's using black and red chalk or pastel pencil. And he's saving the black for his true shadows and using the red mostly for the half tones, which is a technique that uh, Rubens used a lot. And if you've been using a little restraint with your line pressure up till now, this is a good time to look for the darks that really jump out at you in the original and press a little harder. You know, like this eyebrow. the 
this shadow right here. Squint your eyes a little and look, get them a little out of focus. And just make sure the darks in your drawing, the pattern of darks corresponds to the pattern of darks that you're seeing in the original. Okay, that's going to do it for my demo. Thanks for watching.